All right, so I'm gonna be re-carpeting these speakers. These are Dual 15s three-way, uh, bi-amped. And you can see so far on this one, I've taken the carpet off. I've removed the carpet and currently it is ready for sanding. So let me go back over here and I will show you guys how to remove the drivers, uh, remove the crossover um, for the highs and lows, remove the handles and the existing carpet to get it ready for sanding, which will then get it ready for the um, plasticized coating. Well, as you can see, I have the speaker placed down on its back. And the first step that I like to follow is getting rid of the most sensitive components, which are the drivers themselves. So I'm gonna start by removing the grill. Um, these two are separate grills, and then going in and removing the subs, the mids, and then the horn. So, all right. Gonna start by removing the grill. So this should, oh, got caught in the grommet there. This should just lift out. I don't want to just lift it out. I, I don't want these screws to drop in there, but this should lift up like that. Drop a few grommets in there, but yeah, so that's the grill removed. It's a very high gauge grill. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's good for durability, but yeah, it doesn't seem like it lets too much of the sound through. All right, the next step is to remove the drivers. And you wanna be careful so that your drill doesn't slip off and damage the surround. <laughs> I like to put my finger um, on the side of the surround to protect it in case my drill does slip off so that it, uh, it doesn't puncture the, the surround. So my finger is there just in case. So, it is always important to stay organized, and I have bags with each of the screw components, because there's, there's, these look simple, but there's, there's a lot of components. Um, there's separate speakers, sorry, there's separate uh, screws that go in to hold in the subs, the mids, the horn. There's grill screws, there's corner bracing screws, there's internal bracing screws there's screws for the car crossover so and the back plate and the handles on the sides so it's very easy to uh get them mixed up which would not be fun and you don't want to put in either a screw that's too small in a bigger hole or potentially split the wood by putting a screw that's too big in a hole so it's not worth the risk so you got to get organized Remove this screw. Alright. See so that just lifts up. Keep the grommets up. The 
going for the horn. driver that's down there is very sensitive all right so now we can lift the subs out of the box now I've already taken a picture of the polarity but you want to make sure to do that you don't want to have speakers going in uh, opposite directions out of phase because then you're gonna have uh, uh, destructive interference and other funky stuff going on that you don't want to deal with. So these are the drivers. They remind me a lot of uh, JBL drivers. Um, the uh, the SRX series. Nice big magnet. Looks to be about like a three or four inch voice coil. So these have uh, these have got some kick. And especially when you buy amp them, you can really push the drivers. Uh, a little further than you can with uh, with just uh, the internal crossover. So, all right, now I'm going to remove the mid-ranges. These use different screws, if you can't tell, from the sub. Because these, this uh, speaker isn't comp compartmentalized, um, you can see at the back of the mid-ranges is sealed, because um, otherwise the pressure buildup inside would be uh, would interfere with how the mid-ranges would go and it would distort them. Um, they're not meant to deal with pressures like that, so these are sealed. I've, I've dealt with other mid-ranges in the past that have uh, had open backs, but. Um, they usually have like the subs in a sealed off cabinet and then another port designed for the mids and the horn. Um, I mean the horn doesn't really matter because it's sealed anyway, but just for the mid-range design. And these are another set of screws. up from the bottom. Make sure not to bump the wires and that's all the drivers. We'll clean that up later. Uh, all right so let me get this sorted out and then we can start uh, removing other elements um, and then we'll start removing the carpeting. So this is for having those drivers in there. I'm gonna get these out of the way so I don't step on them. 
has happened. Now, I'm going to move on to this side handle. Another 11. I don't know what this is. Well, let me show you. Moving on to the handle, there seems to be some, I don't know if you can see that, but some buildup. Some like, uh, it's almost plastic. But if I just pick at it enough, it, it'll come out. Here, let me, let me show you. Yeah, I mean, I just put the screwdriver in there and kind of wedged it out. But uh, I don't know, it seems like all these screws are kind of gummed up. So uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me deal with that and then we can uh, start unscrewing this handle. So I've cleared out all the, uh, the buildup on the inside of these screws. I'm able to remove them. Let me get my drill in a higher speed here. So we can speed this up a bit. Uh, not sure what that was. It looked like maybe some overspray from some, uh, from some spray paint. I, uh, I bought these speakers used, and I'm really not sure of their history. Um, so, I don't know, it's possible that like a previous owner had uh, re-sprayed one of the handles at some point. I'm not sure. Either way, these just pop up and I have a screw. Got a baggie with the parts for the screws. And then, Next step is going to be taking out those corner braces, so let me get this baggie with the corner braces, and we'll start removing those accordingly. These, uh, these corner braces are nice. I don't see these too often on cabinets, um, but, I mean, that's going to be the most likely failure point for these. I think that one was, yeah, that one was gummed up. See, that's what happens. My drill can, uh, my bit can't go all the way inside the screw head, so it just ends up popping out, and the bit rides the, the top, and it strips out my, my yeah, so. Don't want that to happen. <laughs> back. All right. All right, so these pop on. All right. Oops, come on. All right, so that's all the corner bracing on this side. There are these large machine screws, which I think connect to some threaded inserts um, for what feels like um, they doubled up the thickness of the birch plywood on these sides for added rigidity. Um, I'm looking at this threaded insert. I just noticed it. It seems like it's popping out. Um, here, let me show you. But there are these machine screws, and it looks like on the inside, they go into these threaded inserts. And I'm pretty sure that is to, uh, for added rigidity because they're clasping together two pieces of birch on that side. Um, but this threaded insert on top seems to have never gone in properly, so I'll fix that when I uh, 
when I'm taking these out and uh, before I sand. So, yeah, I mean, these just screw out and uh, you gotta take them out. Oh, there goes the screwdriver. You gotta take them out um, because it kind of pinches the carpet around that area. So you, can, uh, you can't take the carpet off without taking out these, uh, these machine screws. And uh, yeah, so I'll do that for the other side and then we can take off the input plate and the crossover. All right, so for that threaded insert, um, what I did was I first pounded it in in order for the, those, um, I don't know what they are, but for the metal to catch into the wood, then I was able to remove the uh, screw. I pounded it in as far as I could and then I used the screw um, with the screwdriver as tight as I could to pull it in um, into the wood the rest of the way. And it's not perfect, but it'll hold. I and mean, I just don't want any air to escape from there and I want it to be reasonably structurally sound. So now we're gonna flip this around. We're gonna remove that uh, input and uh, biamp selector plate. Then we're gonna flip it back onto this side again, and we're gonna remove the uh, the crossover. And then uh, we can go on to removing the carpet. All right, so we're gonna flip the speaker around now. Um, and I removed those two grommets that fell in there earlier. Um, I retrieved them. So this plate doesn't look like these are gummed up. Should be good. Ugh, I hate stripping screws. That was close, but right away. Yeah, so I purchased these speakers sight unseen. Kinda lowballed the guy uh, off of eBay. And saw it. It was just the next state over, um, which is Illinois. And I was like, you know, it couldn't be, can't be that far. Uh, it, it was, it was like five hours. But uh, yeah, I mean, all I knew, couldn't find any information about these online. Companies seem to have gone bankrupt around 10 years back. So yeah, I was kind of going out on a uh, bit of a risk, but I mean, I saw the one kilowatt RMS on the back, and uh, yeah, I mean, it seems pretty high quality. And when I got there, I took off one of the side plates and saw that it was birch. Took a look at one of the drivers, and I mean, that's all I needed to see. Brought an amp to test both of them, and they checked out. So I was happy with my purchase. Uh, yeah. Um, and so far, when I've been testing them out, they sound pretty good. Um, a little bit weak on the highs. It opens up a bit when you bring the volume up, but at low volumes, I mean, the highs kind of get overpowered by the subs. So definitely better um, to buy amp them if you want precise control over the EQ, but I mean, for my purposes, they're going to be playing pretty loud um, nearly all the time. So uh, yeah, I think it works out pretty well. Got a good deal. So I'm pretty happy. And uh, yeah, let me go put these screws in with the uh, input plate screws. Let's see where they are. grab the baggie for the uh, crossover. And we'll flip this around. I mean, the box is just so much, so much lighter without the drivers in there. I mean, this thing probably weighs only 35 pounds. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's get a close-up of the crossover. 
So there's the crossover in there. I'll try to position my uh, my camera so that you can see it. Um, there's the crossover in there. And there's some components in the way, so I'm gonna need to grab a, uh, a longer drill bit so that I don't damage them with my uh, chuck as I'm going in to unscrew them. So I'll get a longer drill bit on, remove those six screws, then we'll get all the uh, the electronics out of here. All right, so as you can see, I've removed the six screws securing the crossover. So now, being gentle, this should just be able to lift out. And uh, we'll go put it somewhere safe on this table. <laughs> a bit crowded, but uh, yeah, now we're ready to remove the carpeting. All right, so with the speaker face up, we can start removing the carpeting. We can start to remove the carpeting in sections. The tools I use are a uh, utility knife and a flathead to get the carpet started. Uh, when it's like in tight corners, I just pry up on it with the flathead. That usually gets it going. So it's divided up into three sections. We got this lower front facing portion, the upper portion, and then I believe there's one on the back, and then this whole side seemed to be one continuous piece. So, yeah. Um, I do it by just prying up, getting behind it, and just prying up. And I, I, I like to do this slowly, because if I do it too quickly, it leaves behind some of the uh, black carpeting. So you really just gotta take your time. And there seems to be a little less adhesive in this section, so it's going kind of quickly. But I mean, you can see just how easily that comes off. And if you're gonna be renting these out or touring with them, you really don't want to use carpeting. Not only is it not durable, as you can see, I'll just tuck that piece off, it, uh, it absorbs liquids and it's more difficult to clean. So with the Duratex, I'm gonna basically just be forming like a hard plastic shell on the outside that'll help to um, dissipate some of the uh, shock impacts, as well as, I mean, being liquid resistant and very easy to just wipe down and clean. And yeah, I mean, just for the environment I'm gonna be putting these in, uh, where there's gonna be a lot of liquid, um, they're gonna be a little abused. I just wanna make sure that they're um, as safe as possible. And these drivers and the speaker lasts for uh, as long as they can. And you can see there's usually a bit of excess on the inside here. So I kinda take one and I start peeling up from there. Just picking a weak spot. And yeah, I mean, you can see this birch plywood. It's that's standard, but I mean, only professional grade speakers have that stuff usually. And I mean, it's very rigid stuff and it doesn't, if you do get moisture in it, it doesn't tend to want to uh, warp like traditional plywood or delaminate. Um, it's very rigid, um, which is perfect for speaker applications where you don't want the box having uh, a negative impact on the sound if the sidewalls start flexing and absorbing some of that energy, which is going to reduce the output of your system. So you want as rigid of a uh, sidewall structure as you can. You can see I just pried up uh, from the side here, and we're going to continue. See, there's a bit of excess. I'm just gonna remove. They seem to have placed that in there. Possibly. Doesn't seem like it was ever part of the strip. Just scrape that out. I mean, this stuff is almost comedically easy to remove. Uh, very interesting triangular port design. Doesn't seem to be. The ports are only two and a half, three inches deep which is also something I've never seen. Usually they have some uh, some baffling that carries them through the back. Um, so that the 
court has more of a resonance, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not a box design expert. Even for a company that went bankrupt, they uh, likely know a little more than me. So, <laughs> you can see, I'm gonna peel up all this carpet on the front face so that when I flip it back on its front, flip it face down, I won't have to flip it back again to get these edges. So once I do these and I tuck them around, it will hopefully be the last time I see this side before I'm in the sanding room. See, it just takes a little while. This adhesive is getting everywhere. I mean, we're replacing this carpet in two days, which is why I'm doing this inside. Otherwise, I'd be in the garage with a shop vac. But I get the luxury of being able to do this inside. And here is where the carpet comes around joins over here. So we're going to pick one of these sides and start unraveling it. See. Last front facing edge. There's uh, many ways to skin a cat. I don't know if there's more than one way to skin a subwoofer. <laughs> Alright, let's flip it around. Alright. Now, starting from this side. There seems to be like some wood filler, or maybe that's excess wood glue, or possibly the adhesive that they use for the carpeting, but we'll find out when we sand, but a lot of it on the edges. Yeah, it seems like they put a little bit of it more adhesive in this area. sand off, but I have plenty of sandpaper. That's really not wanting to come out. See, I mean, I have to go fast in this area, but it leaves a lot of that stuff behind. <sighs> like lint. Yeah. Come on. Alright. Push it back so I'm still in frame. Alright. Yeah, see, I mean. On the tops and sides, I mean, there, there's barely any glue up here. I mean, that just peeled off. I've had a hard time peeling oranges. On the sides is where they really stuck it down. I 
This head's coming off a little easier. Nice. One big piece of nasty carpet. Now, there's this sign that they use some uh, little uh, trim nails to hold in. So for now, I'm just going to cut around it so we can peel the carpeting away. We'll come back and we'll deal with that in a bit. Uh, here we go. So you kind of, it's stapled down onto the carpet. So I just car cut the carpeting around it that goes underneath it so I can uh, pull up the carpeting around it without having to necessarily remove the sign. Because there's a lot of small nails. They use five small nails to hold it in. And uh, I want to make sure I get those out so it doesn't damage my sander. Uh, all right. That's the other piece. A few more little inserts that they put in here for trim. All right, we'll get rid of this happily. Really not a big fan of carpet. So now I have a few tools that I use to remove the sign that I have prepared. So first, I'm going to go in each of the four corners and remove the small nail. And then there's one more one in the center. So just come in, pry up. Oh, don't stab yourself. Pry up. And pry up. You can see one more one in the center there. So come in, take it off, eh, that can be repaired, I mean, it's not ideal, but I would like to keep these signs so I uh, have some uh, reference as to the specifications of the speaker, and in case I ever want to sell them in the future for the buyer. So now we have these very, very close to flush trim nails that are going to need to come out, so I have this nail puller that is, has a very, very, very fine uh, jaw at the front. It's gonna be perfect for pulling these up. And, and it's a bit tight. Let's get my pliers for that. This one, unlike the other one, they seem to have used three. It seems like someone had the nail gun on a bit of a too high of a setting and they pierced through the uh, the aluminum the first two times. And it looks like they got it on the third. So <laughs> maybe now we know why they went out of business. <laughs> I get my, uh... Projectile though. Uh, let me see. Maybe I have some needle nose. Uh, Alright, these will do the trick. Just gotta get a flush and pull these guys up. You know what? I can feel them from the underside. Let me, uh, let me flip this around and we can just use the hammer. Uh, 
be easier. So I just pushed them through partially. But it should be enough for my nail puller to come in and for me to finish off the job. There's one. And here comes number two. Come on. That one did not want to come out. Alright. You can see. I mean, stuff like this, you really want to take out, because that'll just tear apart your, uh, your sandpaper. So, yeah, so we started off with a box that was fully carpeted with drivers, and you can see now, we have stripped it down of all the accessories, gotten it, uh, right where we want it, uh, and now we're ready to move over to the other room and uh, get some sandpaper and uh, go to town. All right. So now we're in the sanding room and you can see, I'm gonna start with the back. Really no preference. I just wanna see how this 60 grit works on the uh, taking off the adhesive and smoothing out that filler that they use. Um, yeah, this is going to make a lot of dust. So you want to do it either outside or in your garage or in a sealed room. Like this, this door can close if I move that speaker. And yeah, uh, hopefully we can get this down to a nice coarse finish. So it's something where the, uh, a finish that the Duratex can really lock into. Um, you don't want to do this. You don't want to use 300 or something like that because that's not going to create a lot of uh, ridges for the uh, Duratex to really have a lot more surface area to connect with your uh, uh, birch plywood. So you want to use something rough that'll create like mi microscopic ridges and fuse the two together. So yeah. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go get a mask. But uh, yeah, it's gonna come up looking really nice. So yeah. All right, so sorry for not showing the process of sanding it down. Um, for each of the sides, I started with a razor paint scraper, um, a four inch paint scraper, and just went little by little and removed off the majority of the glue. And then I went back um, with some 80 grit um, and a palm sander and finished it off. Um, the paint scraper would get caught and it left me with a little bit of pitting. As you can see right there, it's not too bad. I think it'll probably show up with the exohide. Um, I'm not too particular. Um, if I was really trying to get like a nice even finish, I would definitely use some <clears throat> uh, non-shrinking spackle um, and fill in those and then re-sand it to get a very nice finish but I mean I'm not super particular I'm really just trying to get these speaker pr speakers protected um, for when I use them on the road but yeah I mean you can see they look a bit different with all that glue and gunk removed so, yeah, I just rubbed the surfaces down with alcohol, um, with a little bit of alcohol to get rid of any remaining oil and uh, sanding dust. So now I'm gonna wait for this to dry a little more for about 10 more minutes, and we're gonna crack open the exo hide, give it a little stir, and yeah, we're just gonna start applying it. Um, not really too much to it. I've decided that with a gallon, these are around, I believe, 52 inches. Um, so they're quite big boxes, but I'm hoping to get around three coats. Um, 
on the back and then on the front I might just do one uh, or two coats because that's not going to be seeing as much wear. That's really just to keep the moisture out and to continue the aesthetic. Um, but I mean these are the faces that are going to be seeing the majority of the uh, wear and tear usually. So yeah. Um, let me wait for this to dry and we'll start applying the, uh, the exohide. Alright, so fast forward a bit. I've got my first coat down on that box. And now about 70% of the way through with coating this one. And I left a little demonstration patch to see how this goes on. Now you don't want to apply too much pressure because then you're just going to end up dragging the roller. So, very moderate amount of pressure. And you just kind of work it in there. And when you see it, it starts taking a few more rolls to get the same amount of coverage. You go, and I just like to, and this stuff is, let me turn the light on. So this stuff is rigid enough to where you can just kind of roll <laughs> the brush on top. And then you just go back and you just reapply. There's really not much to it. You can see, I mean, this stuff goes on really thick. So even the worst, not recommended, but I found that it covers up some pretty big flaws with the wood. So it is a little forgiving, unlike the directions on the back, which make it seem like you need to do all this surface prep. I mean, that finish, you saw how the wood looked like before. I mean, that looks pretty many. So yeah, I mean, this stuff is great. So let me finish the first coat on here, and then we'll come back and do the second coat. And uh, yeah, on the third coat, we'll flip it over, and we'll do the front. All right, so as you can see, I've now moved the whole operation to the garage. I've skipped a few steps. I know I was supposed to show um, doing, I believe, the third coat on the back side. I've since completed the third coat and done only two coats on the front. Um, and I assembled this speaker just as a test. And even with this added thickness and it not being as flat as the original birch, um, it still makes a good enough seal. I tested 20 through probably around 40 hertz near max volume and there were no detectable leaks. I mean, this is also a vented uh, enclosure. So there's not as much pressure buildup inside of it, like some other sealed enclosures that I've done. But um, I was still worried that the um, elevated surface and knew it's a bit more uneven, that that would lead to some uh, leak problems. Um, as you can see, I've just started reassembling this one, and I start by reattaching the crossover. And then I'm going to flip it over and reattach the plate. Um, I've distributed where each of the sends are for each of the uh, drivers. And then, yeah, um, another point to note is that if you have, um, uh, if you have drivers that are mounted in your box with relatively tight tolerances, you're going to need to, uh, shave back, um, the cutout, uh, to allow for, um, the slight reduction in diameter that is created when uh, this plasticized paint kind of leaks over. Um, so I just took a utility knife and made uh, several passes and removed off any excess um, material. And you can kind of see from a side profile that it's pitched that way a bit. And that's because I took a utility knife and was cutting at it like this. Um, but yeah, now um, the drivers sit in there very well. Um, I was having some issues originally with my first test driver of it not wanting to sit all the way down into the hole, which obviously would not create, would create a lot of problems with both, uh, when you tighten down the screws, you don't want to bend the frame uh, of the driver. And you also want to ensure that you have a good seal so that you get the maximum efficiency out of uh out of your subwoofer um, along with the other speakers so yeah uh, i'm gonna flip it over and i'm gonna mount the plate and then we're gonna go around 
and uh, reinsert these machine, uh, these machine screw um, threaded insert supports. All right, so in addition to getting the crossovers and actually fully assembled um, the speaker portion um, of this Dual 15, I still have to uh, install the corner uh, brackets, but I had some trouble uh, getting this grill between this horn and this mid. Um, so what I had to do was I had to install the mid and the grill first and then come at it from the other side with the horn because the gap between the top of this driver and the bottom of this horn uh, wasn't big enough for the for the 12 or 14 gauge grill. So I had to do it. Uh, I had to end up removing the horn and then putting it in after these two were in. Um, and now it's sitting flush. It's just, it was probably off by like 0.1 or uh, 0.3 millimeters, which uh, um, is okay if you uh, sequence the, the order in which you put the drivers in. And now I have it hooked up to uh, the CPX 2600 and I'm just doing some, I'm running it in bi-amp mode and I'm just running the lows, um, the 215s, and I'm trying to build up a lot of cabinet pressure and going around and trying to hear if there are any leaks. Because as I mentioned before, uh, with this coating on there, um, you're gonna be introducing some uh, new ways for air to escape, especially considering the fact that the old carpeting that was underneath the drivers and the mids and the handles and uh, the input plate uh, kind of acted like a gasket when it was uh, pinched down. So with this new uh, plastic, which doesn't conform to the drivers as much, you want to make sure that <clears throat> after you reinstall your speakers that you're not dealing with any leaks or something that would either uh, degrade the sound integrity of your, of your uh, speaker system uh, and also reduce the efficiency because you're going to have not as much, not as high of a pressure build up inside the cabinet. So you're not going to have um, as much of a pronounced low end as you did originally. And the goal of this process is to maintain or exceed um, the factory performance of this uh, speaker. So let me uh, hook up a frequency sweep and we're going to see if there are any leaks on this cabinet. All right, so I did a frequency sweep and actually there's a little bit of air escaping right through this portion of the horn and obviously through the uh, grill knobs, there's some air coming through um, and a little bit around the sides of the input plate. So I might go get some black silicone uh, just to keep the aesthetic and go in and run a small bead here um, and around the back of the input plate. Interestingly enough, the TRS connections, or I'm not sure if they're TRS uh, when they're running um, the speaker, as you can see on this one, uh, there's actually air coming out of these. Um, and because I don't ever use these, I might get um, plugs and just plug them in there uh, when they're not in use, uh, just to prevent any air from escaping. But uh, yeah, everything else sounds good. Um, I took off this logo, so I'm going to have to find a method to remove the remainder of this two-part epoxy, um, whether that be some abrasive and then going over and painting the, the, the grill again, um, which I wouldn't like to do. I'd find, I'd like to find a way to just uh, take off that, but I'm not sure if that exists. So, uh, yeah, let me go get some cleaning solutions and we'll see if we can take this off.